Great. So um, welcome to the NOCO Pro Programming for Biology uh, workshop tonight. Um, what we're going to do in today's session is um, really some kind of basics to get you started with the Grove board that hopefully you will have. Um, so I'll just introduce uh, myself and Jim will introduce himself and uh, I'll let you know a little bit about Biomaker and the NOCO Programming for Biology workshops that we're doing and why we're doing them. Uh, then we'll get started with uh, the first lesson in the beginner's guide, um, which is just an introduction to the Grove Board. Um, so uh, this is the Grove Board. Uh, I think you've all got one. Um, and what it is, um, what all the different parts are, and uh, Zod, which is the software that we're going to be using to program the board. Uh, and then in the second half of the session, uh, we'll actually get started with using the board. Uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to um, kind of uh, demonstrate uh, what we do, and then uh, we'll just let you guys have a go, and you can ask any questions as you go along, and we can troubleshoot. Um, and we have a couple of tasks prepared, but um, we'll see how far we get and, um, you know, we can go at whatever pace we need to go at. Uh, and so we'll be starting with some really simple things today, like using the, the LED and the buzzer. Uh, but we have another session next week, which you can come along to uh, and we'll do uh, some more advanced things uh, as well. So hopefully you can get kind of confident with using Zod and programming your board. Uh, so as I said, uh, just um, to introduce ourselves, so my name's Steph, I'm the events manager and coordinator for the uh, synthetic biology uh, network at the University of Cambridge um, and for Open Plant, which is collaboration between the university, uh, the John Innes Centre and the Earlham Institute in Norwich, uh, which is focused specifically on synthetic biology and plants. Uh, so my role is to organize events and training and networking for researchers in synthetic biology. Uh, and I work quite closely with Professor Jim Haslov at the university, who's also here. And I'll just let Jim introduce himself as well. Well, hi, everybody. Um, so I, I help manage a lab in the uh, plant sciences department in the university. And we're very interested in engineering approaches at a fairly fundamental level. And in the university proper, we um, because there's a number of initiatives which are aimed at trying to build better bridges between biology, engineering, and computer sciences, for example. Uh, we in, the, in, in our lab have been trying to promote different activities that help um, build that bridge. And Biomaker is one of them. So it's looking at how you can uh, use tools for programming that are more intuitive for biologists, often visual rather than text-based. And hopefully you'll see first with this taster session and then uh, hopefully next week is as well, get a handle on um, this combination of graphical approaches to programming and simple hardware, which makes things much more accessible. And further, it's more utilitarian for people working in a biology, either environmental or plant or subcellular biology, where you can use this to make instruments. Um, and some of the things that um, will go on from this are the use of these simple software and hardware systems to create instruments, to um, build uh, graphical interfaces, touch screens, et cetera. So there's a whole range of different um, activities and we try and capture this, um, um, op these opportunities, if you like, uh, in the form of small scale projects that we fund. So there's the Biomaker Challenge, which we run each year. And uh, that is an opportunity for people to come together. Particularly, uh, we try and encourage people across institutions um, on, and across disciplines to come together around some kind of team and um, where people bring their own skill sets, but they, um, by interacting with other people, they're certainly exposed to other approaches and tools, etc. So uh, if you look at biomaker.org, our main website, you'll see links to all kinds of different crazy projects where people have embarked on this journey of um, you know, using simple hardware and software and taking that forward in a way that makes practical biological instruments or tools. And we hope that at least some of you might be interested in uh, heading in that direction. And we've got um, funding for small scale projects coming up. Um, so there's an opportunity there. Anyway, if you've got any questions about this or anything else, obviously Steph and I can, can help out. 
and I'll hand it back to you, sir. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, Jim also already mentioned um, Biomaker, as he said, um, it's, it's um, the challenge is all about funding interdisciplinary teams, um, specifically uh, people at the intersection of biology, engineering, computer science, those kind of uh, things. Uh, so the project's been running for several um, several years now, and um, one of the things that that they were finding was that um, for a lot of biologists, there's a bit of a barrier to entry in terms of um, working with Arduinos and things like that because they just don't necessarily have the experience. Um, so the idea behind the no code programming course was essentially to, to help um, biologists gain these skills and get kickstarted in this area. So as Jim said, uh, we're working uh, with really simple hardware. We have these growth boards um, from Seed Studio uh, and they have a load of useful um, sensors and, and components already built into the board. So we don't have to learn about electronics or wiring or anything like that. And then the other half is all about um, graphical programming. So instead of text-based programming, we're using SOD software, which allows us um, to, to program uh, in a kind of visual way. Um, and you know, it doesn't require hours and hours learning a new coding language. So um, hopefully by combining these two things, we can help um, get biologists kind of kick-started with building their own devices for things like the Biomaker Challenge or, or whatever you're interested in. Uh, so just before we start, hopefully you all got the message of a couple of things that needed um, that you needed to do. So downloading the Zod software, um, downloading the latest version of the beginner's guide and checking that you have the right USB drives installed. Uh, I should say the Zod software um, can be downloaded from the Zod website, which is www.zod.io. Uh, so getting started with lesson one, it's all about the board and the Zod environment. Uh, so I'll just quickly run through uh, the Grove board um, and tell you a bit about uh, what each of the parts are and what they might be useful for. Uh, so starting in up here in the top left, uh, we've got an LED and a buzzer. These can be really useful devices uh, for things like warnings or alarms. Say if you've got an environmental sensor and you want it to notify you um, when it's gone over temperature or something like that, they can be really useful. Uh, they're also really useful for just kind of playing around and getting started, uh, which is what we're going to be using today. Then below that, we have the OLED screen. Uh, this is uh, just a little uh, 128 by 64 pixel display. Uh, and that's really useful because we can display basically anything we want on there. So uh, text, readings from the sensors, images, um, it's uh, very versatile. So it's really useful to have that on board. Uh, we'll be hopefully exploring that in the session next week. Uh, then below that, we have a button and a, what they call a rotary potentiometer. Uh, this is essentially just like a little knob, like a volume knob. Um, and these are both just kind of useful input devices for controlling your board. So obviously you can use the button to turn things uh, on or off and the, um, the potentiometer knob to, to do things like change the frequency of the buzzer or something, um, which we're gonna have a go at later. Uh, then over on the right-hand side, we have a whole load of um, useful environmental sensors, which is um, one of the reasons that, that um, this board is so useful for uh, biology specific course because often that's the kind of thing we want to do in the lab. Uh, so we have a light sensor and sound sensor. We have a temperature and humidity sensor. We have an air pressure sensor uh, or barometer. Uh, this can also be used um, to measure altitude as well. Um, and it, it also has a temperature sensor inbuilt so you can use either of those as a temperature sensor. <clears throat> Sorry. And finally, we have the uh, three axis acceleration sensor. Uh, so this is essentially um, a bit like the sensors in your phone so that can tell when your phone's being moved around or tilted or anything. Uh, essentially, it's a, a tilt sensor. So um, if we move the board, it, it, it can um, sense that. 
Uh, so those are all the kind of um, inbuilt components. And then in the center here, we have um, the kind of the brains of the board. So this is the, um, the Cduino part, which is basically a, an Arduino um, microcontroller board. Uh, we'll, I'll go into a little more details about what that actually means and what it does in a second. Um, but essentially that's where all the computing goes on. And it also has, uh, you can see these series of white plug sockets. Uh, so those are useful because um, if you ever want to expand your board or add other sensors or other components, uh, you can just plug them straight into these little white sockets here as well. So I mentioned the microcontroller, but what actually is that? Uh, so uh, on the top left here, you can see this little chip. That's the microcontroller that is used uh, in this um, Grove board. And uh, essentially it's like a tiny little electronic chip that acts like a small computer. Uh, so it has memory and it has a processor, uh, but unlike a computer, it's usually programmed to run a single program and perform that one single task. Uh, so once we've uploaded a program to this chip, every time you turn on the board, it will perform that same task. And this is the, a reprogrammable microcontroller. So um, we can write over that program as many times as we want, um, but we can only ever have one program on there at once. Uh, so the microcontroller then uh, is, is the kind of brains and it communicates with uh, the other devices on the board, um, like the LED or the sensors, uh, by uh, these little silver pins around the outside. And um, each pin or each port as they're called um, in, in Zod is, is given a name. So A0 to A6, D0 to D13. Um, and they connect to one device. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of background about these kind of three different um, categories that we'll be using. Um, there, are, there are kind of lots of different types of PIN, but the ones that we'll be looking at are analog, digital, and I2C. Uh, so analog PINs are used for analog devices. Um, so many of the sensors, anything that has a kind of continuous value and analog output. Uh, the digital PINs are obviously used for digital devices. So anything that operates in a discrete on-off pattern, like the LED, for example. And then the I2C is uh, essentially a special type of digital communication where you can actually have several different devices connected to the same pin. And then you tell which uh, device is which by giving them a name or an address. So uh, here on this board, uh, the three axis uh, acceleration sensor has the address 19H, the air pressure sensor has uh, 77H and the OLED screen has 3CH. Um, so that's just um, a way of, of using the same pin but having actually several different devices on it. Um, don't worry if that's a bit confusing, you don't have to remember that. The, the reason we need to know about this is essentially that when we're programming, we need to know which um, device is connected to which pin because we need to input that information into the program. Uh, and actually really usefully on the Grove board, uh, it says right next to um, each component, which pin it's connected to. So just above the component, um, it has like a little white uh, name and next to it, it says the name of the pin. So for example, next to LED, it says D4. So we know that the LED is connected to pin D4. Okay. So uh, we have our board with a microcontroller and the microcontroller communicates with these components. Um, but how do we actually program that board? Uh, so this is just to quickly describe the kind of workflow that we'll be going through. Uh, so we start on our laptop or our PC. Uh, we open the Zod software. We create our program in Zod and then uh, we upload it via USB cable to the Arduino board. Uh, on the Arduino board, it's stored on the microcontroller. And then uh, that's in the memory of the microcontroller. So we can, um, we could, if we wanted to unplug it from the computer and plug it into a different power source and it would still run that same program. Uh, and then as we said, the microcontroller then 
communicates with the components via its uh, pins. That's everything about the board. Um, I can answer questions now if anyone has one, or um, if you think of a question later, please feel free to ask. Otherwise, I'll carry on and I'll just give you a little bit of an introduction to the Zod software that we're going to be using. So this is the, the Zod software. This is the kind of screen you'll get the first time you open it. And I'll just take you through the kind of different parts that we'll be using and, and what they do. This kind of central portion of the screen, uh, this is called your patch. It's essentially like a blank canvas um, or, or a, a file. And we'll, this is the area that we'll be using to build our programs. Uh, so in Zod, instead of writing text, we build programs using these little black boxes called nodes. Uh, so you can see that this patch has three nodes on it, uh, one called clock, one called count, and one called watch. I'll talk a bit more about those later, but essentially we put nodes into the patch and we link them together to make our program. Next up here, we have uh, the project browser. And uh, next to where it says project browser, we have a couple of useful buttons, uh, primarily the one that looks like a little page. Uh, so that is new patch. So we can create a new file. And uh, next to that, the one that looks like some little books, that's the add library button. Uh, so we'll be using that later in the session. Uh, essentially, all of the nodes in Zod are organized into libraries. Um, there's some kind of core libraries which Zod has made themselves, and then um, users are free to make their own libraries um, and make new nodes. Some of the devices on the board, Zod doesn't have a node for, but other people have made them. So. It's really useful to be able to add other people's libraries as well. Still in the project browser, but below those buttons is your project and your patches. The kind of Zod terminology, a project is basically like a, a folder and a patch is basically like a file. So you have your project and it's full of patches and each patch acts like a separate program. We'll go through this when we, when we do the examples anyway, but you can see up here um, that there's a project called Welcome to Zod and there's patches called hello and um, simulate an inspector, et cetera. So below that, still in the same kind of project browser pane is then where all of your libraries are. Um, so if it's the first time that you're using the software, it, all of these will probably be Zod forward slash something because they're all of the Zod pre-installed ones. Uh, I obviously have more libraries installed here. And they, if, when you add new libraries using that library button, that's where they'll appear. Uh, then below that is the inspector pane. Uh, so this is where we're actually going to be kind of editing our nodes. So uh, when we put a new node in the patch, um, we want to change some of the parameters. Uh, we'll click on the node and uh, some information will appear in this inspector pane. And um, that's where we can edit all of those properties. And then over here on the right is the quick help pane. Uh, this is really useful. If you can't see it, by the way, um, there's, there should be a little question mark button in the top right. And if you click on that, then the quick help pane should appear. And that is really useful when you're learning because it basically, um, when you click on a node, it tells you all about that node. It tells you what each of the, the pins does. Um, so that's really useful to, to kind of have open whilst you're working because you can um, check things out in there. And then I think the final thing is these um, little buttons at the bottom of your patch down there, the upload buttons. Uh, so the two that we're going to be using are upload, which is like a little lightning bolt, and upload and debug, which is uh, like a little ladybird. Uh, just another note on the kind of terminology in Zod, because they, they have all these kind of specific names for things. So we already said that uh, you have a project and within your project, you have patches, which are like files. Uh, and we said that we build up our programs using nodes. Uh, so nodes can represent a number of different things. They can represent hardware. So you can have an LED node or a buzzer node, or they can represent functions. So, um, and or um, count, which obviously counts up, those kind of things. So basically everything in Zod is built with these nodes. Uh, and they look like this, they're a little black box. Uh, they have um, a number of circles on the top and bottom. 
So these circles are called pins and those are essentially the inputs and outputs. So on the top you have the input pins and on the bottom you have the output pins. Just a quick note that um, Zod uses the word pin differently to a microcontroller pin. Um, so they're not the same thing, which is slightly confusing. Um, but Zod calls the pins on a microcontroller ports. And finally, links. So, um, you know, we build our program um, by adding in these nodes and then we link them together to, to build the program and to make it work. Okay, so we're going to get started with uh, testing our board. So, what I'm going to do is share my screen and work through an example. And then um, maybe we will um, split off into two groups and we can just work through the problem. So I'll, I'll have done the example. The, there's also a step-by-step -step guide in that beginner's guide that hopefully you've all downloaded. Um, so we can go through uh, the tasks as we go. Okay, great. So um, as I said, this is the, um, the Zod software. Um, it's not the first time I've opened this software. So I have a slightly different screen, uh, but either way, if we wanna start a completely new project, um, the first thing we can do is basically um, make a new project so that we have a clean slate. So if we come up here to file, new project, there we go. So it's opened a new, a new project here and it's called my project. It has one patch that's called main. Uh, if you can't see the patches within the project, this little toggle button here will show you all the patches. So I, um, I only have one patch, but yeah. Okay, great. So um, the first thing that we're going to do is just turn on the LED. So basically just to check that all our connections are working and that our board is working, uh, we're just going to do something really simple. So as I said, um, we build programs in Zod using nodes and um, nodes can represent hardware or functions. So if we want to use the LED, the first thing we want to do is put an LED node into the patch. So as I said, uh, the nodes are organized into libraries. The LED node is in the Zod common hardware library. Click the little uh, drop down button and we can find the node called LED. We click on it, drag it into the patch and we now have an LED node in our patch. We can see that this node has uh, three input pins at the top here, port, lum and act and it has one output pin called done. Uh, so the first thing we wanna do is change the properties of some of these pins so that we can set up the node right so that it can communicate with our board. So as I said, when we click on the node, information appears both in the inspector pane over on the left and the quick help pane over on the right. And the quick help pane, it gives you a bit of information about what the node does and then tells you what each of the uh, pins does as well. And then over on the left, this is where we actually do the editing. If we look at our board and next to where it says LED at the top, um, we can see that it says D4. So we know that the LED is connected to port D4. Uh, so we're just going to change that parameter now, uh, D4. The next input pin is LUM. We can see in the quick help pane, it tells us what this does. It um, represents luminance. Um, so zero being the LED is off and one being the LED is uh, the brightest. So we'll set that to one so we can definitely see it. And then act is a Boolean pin, so it can be true or false. And that essentially says whether it's gonna update or not. So we want, we definitely want it to, the program to update. Uh, so we'll set that to true. Hopefully that all makes sense. Um, this seems really simple, but this is our first program. So we're actually going to go ahead and upload this. I mentioned that the upload button is down here. Um, I think you can um, use another way by going to deploy upload to Arduino. Either way, um, you get the same window that opens like this and you have to set a couple of parameters first. Um, so the first one is the board model. Uh, there's a whole load of different options here, but the one that we want is Arduino Uno. Uh, and then the serial port basically tells it which 
computer port it's uh, the board is connected to. So there should be one that says uh, has silicon labs in brackets. Um, so these are just headphones, um, but that's the correct one. So once we've set those two, we only need to set them once. And then every time we, we do it after that, they'll come up with the same. So we don't need to worry about that every time. And we just click upload. And I'm just gonna show you on my board uh, what's happening. So I don't know whether you saw that, but the LED at the top here just turned on. Um, so that's really simple, but that's all we're gonna do for now. Um, make sure everyone's boards are working and then we can go on and do a couple more tasks. Uh, so I think uh, I'll just go ahead with the, the next kind of task that we were gonna do. Um, so this is essentially just um, a little expansion on this um, simple patch. Now, instead of just turning the LED on, we want to actually control the LED. Um, so we're going to use the button to um, switch the LED on and off. Again, the, uh, the button is in the same uh, library as the LED, the Zod Common Hardware Library. So I can see it right here. Uh, and I, again, I can just drag this over into the patch we now have the button node in there as well. So same as before, we need to make sure that the, um, the input pins are set correctly. Um, so if we look on our board next to where it says button, it says D6. So the port needs to be set as D6. And then the update pin um, basically specifies how often it updates. So we just want it to be continuously updating. We said it to continuously, it says loop here. Um, so that's now all nice and set. Uh, so this is where we get to the, um, the point where we have our two nodes and we actually need to connect them. So this is where we start making links and this is essentially how we build up a program in Zod. So we want to make a link between this press pin here, um, uh, PRS, it stands for press. So uh, that will switch to true when you press the button. Uh, and we want to link that to the LUM pin of the LED. So what that will basically do is when you press the button, um, that then sends a signal via this link from the button uh, to the LED. And it affects the luminosity of the LED. Uh, so if I upload this now, I'll show you what happens on my board. So as it's uploading, there's some little lights down here um, that flash. And at the bottom of your um, Zod screen, you'll get like a little uh, progress bar. And then when it's done, you'll know that it's uploaded. So then I think you can still see my screen. There's like a little notification that says uploaded successfully. Um, so it's not done perhaps what we were expecting. We we're expecting it to turn off and then we could press the button and it would turn on. But actually if you see, it's basically doing the opposite. So when I press the button, the LED turns off. Um, and this is basically just due to a little uh, quirk in Zod that the button node is automatically set to um, be on rather than off. Uh, but we can fix that and we'll, for that we'll use um, a different type of node. So, you know, these nodes we talked about that nodes can represent different things earlier. Um, so the two nodes that we have on here at the moment both represent hardware, the button and the LED, uh, but there are lots of other nodes that represent other functions as well. So if we go to a different um, library, this one called Zod Core, and open that, uh, we can find a node called Not. Here we go, drag it into the patch. Uh, and I think you can see over in the help pane that tells us um, what this node is doing. Uh, so this node just has one input and one output and all it does is inverse um, a Boolean value of true false. So basically, we're just going to insert this into our patch between the button and the LED. And that's going to switch 
the program around so it does exactly what we want it to do. So to do that, uh, we can click on this link, this line here, and delete it. Shuffle the not node in, and then reconnect like this. Then again, I'm gonna upload. And this time it should work how we want to. So sometimes there are kind of little tweaks like this, um, but it's really useful to kind of explore the different nodes that um, that Zod has on offer. So you know what, what you can achieve and how you might be able to, to kind of tweak things when they're not do, working how you want them to work. So it's uploaded now. And this time um, you can see that the button is uh, turning the LED on and it's the, the right way around. Can I just say one thing too, which mm -hmm. um, is just the shortcut. If you know what the name of the node you want is. So if you want an LED node, if you just double click on the work surface and then you'll get a um, box just what, as Steph's demonstrating now, which is really handy. Just yeah, make so sure you click the right one. That's, that's, that's the tricky bit. So yeah, it's in the Zog Common Hardware Library. So it's this one. And then you just click on that. So this is how I usually insert stuff. Um, again, in the beginner's guide, there is there is um, a little kind of text box that says about the different ways you can add a node. Um, but yeah, that shortcut is really useful. Yeah, so the next thing uh, that was essentially, um, if, you, if you take a look through the beginner's guide uh, after this session, everything that we've done in this session is, is in there. Um, that was essentially task one. Task two is then kind of expanding on this a bit, learning how to add a library, learning how to add other inputs, also using a new device. So instead of the LED, we're gonna um, practice with the buzzer. So to add a new library, we talked about at the beginning is this little um, button up here. You have to type the full name of the library, unlike when you start typing the name of a node, it kind of looks up, um, but it doesn't seem to do that with libraries. Um, the library is called Marco Aita MA Library. Uh, here we go. Uh, so I already have this installed, but if you just click on that, it will um, install the library for you. When it does, you may get a little notification um, at the bottom of your screen saying that you need to install dependencies. Um, you can just click OK on that or upload or what, whatever it says. Um, and that should install everything. And then any new libraries that you install will basically appear above the Zod libraries here. And again, you can either add nodes directly from the library or by double clicking on the patch and searching for the node we want. So the node we want is called Buzzer. Buzzer from Marco Aita MA library. So all we're going to do at first is uh, switch out this buzzer node for the LED node. So it's really simple. We can click on the LED, delete it, add in the buzzer. Um, we can set the buzzer pins, uh, same as we did for the other nodes. So every time you add a node, you need to make sure the pins are set. Um, if we look at the board next to where it says buzzer, it says D5. So that's already set correctly. The, the next one is uh, a Boolean pin. So whether the buzzer is on, true or off, false. We're actually not gonna set that because we're gonna use um, the connection to set that. So once you've connected a node like this, you can't actually edit it because instead of you defining what that pin is, um, that's gonna come from the program above it. The final pin uh, in the buzzer is the frequency, so that will um, tell the buzzer what frequency to sound at uh, in hertz. So we can leave that as 440, we can change it if we want. Either way, uh, hopefully that's gonna work. So again, I can upload this. So now we can see when I press on the button, the buzzer sounds. Uh, so the next thing we're going to do is add another input from the board. So we're going to add um, this potentiometer here. So this little um, 
twisty knob. Um, so again, Zod already has a node for this, um, so I can find it. Uh, it's called pot for potentiometer, and it's in the common hardware library. Add that, and we are going to use this node to change the frequency. You know, we could try connecting it to the enable pin to use it as a switch, but actually we'll try controlling this other um, input pin here, the frequency. So if I try and link this directly to here, I'll show you what happens if I upload the, the program like this, because again, it's not quite how you'd expect. There's another node we need to add in there. Um, so when we do this, because we still have the button on there, I'll need to hold down the button to make it work, but I don't know if you can hear this. Hopefully you can. It's not really changing that much. And essentially the reason for that, as we can see, if we, uh, if we click on that node and look over in the, the quick help pane over here that tells us a bit about the node, we can see um, that the range of this output, this value output is between one and zero. And the range of the buzzer um, is obviously a frequency in Hertz. So like between one and zero Hertz is not gonna make much difference. So what we wanna do to change that is essentially add a node that will allow us to remap these ranges. Uh, so usefully that node is called map. It's from the Zod math library and we can add it here. Uh, again, we're gonna delete this line and add this in here. So we add it to the input X. Um, if, we, uh, if we look at the quick help, you can see that X is the, the value that we want to map and the output comes over here to the frequency. So the pins that we have are um, S min and max, T min and T max. Again, it says over in the quick help pane what they are. That's really useful to know. Basically, it's the source range and then the target range. So we know from um, just looking that the potentiometer range is between zero and one. So we'll set zero and one. And then we can basically set whatever range of Hertz we want the frequency to be. So I will try 200 to 1000. We can upload again. I'll let it upload. Okay, so now if I press my button down and move the potentiometer, hopefully you can all hear. That that is actually changing the frequency as well. So that's, it's just a few simple tasks to get you started, um, get you set up with a couple of the, the simple input and output devices on the board and to get you using a couple of different types of node in Zod. Uh, that's basically uh, it for getting started today. So you can now all program your Arduino board and you've all got a bit of an idea of um, how to set up a simple program in Zod. Just to kind of set you a little micro challenge for next week. I think some of you are already kind of playing around with, um, with Zod and the different things you can do, um, but really it is the kind of the best way to work out what's possible is just to play with things. So, you know, play with the pin parameters, see if you, what happens when you change things, um, see if you can achieve different things. So can you make the buzzer turn on and the LED turn off at the same time? Can you get your light to flash? Um, things like that. So. Um, I'll send around an email after we've finished, um, but if you just want to have a go at these little tasks, that's a really good way to, to get a bit more comfortable with using uh, Zod programming as well. And just to quickly um, wrap up and tell you a bit about what we'll be doing next week. Um, so hopefully you've all, all downloaded the beginner's guide and have been using that today. Um, we went through lesson one and lesson two, uh, which is a, a red section and a green section, I think. Um, next time we will do a little bit on lesson three, which is all about some of the most useful nodes in Zod, but we won't be doing a hands-on session. So if you're super keen and uh, you're enjoying this as well, please feel free to work through lesson three. 
We will go over uh, some of the basics of that at the start of next session. And then really what we want to spend uh, the most of next session doing is um, showing you something a little bit more complicated in Zod. So how to build your own node so that you can use the, um, the OLED screen on the device. Uh, so this is uh, really useful because it can basically allow you to do a lot of other stuff as well. And it brings in some of the more complicated um, functions of Zod uh, that will hopefully give you a really good grounding for when you want to make your own um, stuff. And then if we have time, um, we'll, we'll break out again and um, you can have a little play around and see, see what you can do with your board. So as we mentioned at the beginning, this course came out of the Biomaker Challenge as a way to, to kind of help biologists get those skills so that they can actually do stuff like this. Um, so if you are interested in building your own devices and you want to get some funding to do so, um, we'll be holding a briefing on Monday and basically we'll be telling you how you can apply for this year's challenge. And that's it for today. So uh, I'll just check the chat to make sure um, no one's asked any last minute questions, but um, thank you all for coming and um, hopefully it was useful and you enjoyed it. <laughs>